Well, we'll read Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11, but let's pray first. Lord, we thank you for the word of God, and you said that though heaven and earth pass away, there will be not one jot or tittle of what you've said that will ever be rescinded or changed or fall short, and we know that it is perfect, and therefore we seek you for grace this night, knowing that it's not uh, carnally discerned, but spiritually, and so we pray for your uh, word and gracious help this evening. Forgive us also, forgive me for that's all amiss in my heart this evening, but Lord, would you indeed instruct us and lead us on and strengthen us this night, we ask. Amen. Well, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 11, uh, just on for a few verses. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of his people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say confederacy? Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear. And let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offence to both the house of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I'll, st I'll stop the reading there and I'd like to speak this evening on both that, that um, prohibition, the negative statement of do not walk like this people and do not fear their fear. But the positive of sanctify the Lord of hosts, let him be your fear. And I'd like to speak on that topic, that subject tonight, to sanctify the Lord of hosts in our hearts. And it was a really terrible time in Judah, as you'll remember and know well. This was a time when the nation of Israel had been divided in those two parts. There was Israel and there was Judah. And this prophecy is directed primarily towards the people of Judah at that time and they they were in a dark time and maybe one of their great perils was that they did have a very wicked king at that time and and it's a peril for the land isn't it when the the rulers are are wicked in their ways and Ahaz who is the king now was a particularly wicked man I say that with no delight or condemnation on him but rather it's just the way that the scripture absolutely describes him and he was the grandson of of Uzziah, King Uzziah, and the, the one in chapter 6 of Isaiah, that in the year that Uzziah died, that's when he had the vision of the Lord high and lifted up. And Ahaz begins appearing in the book of Isaiah in chapter 7. And he was the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, Uzziah, King of Judah. But he was unlike his father, Jotham, who is a godly king. Isaiah, sorry, Ahaz was not. And it's recorded in the book of Kings, in the book of Chronicles. But in the book of Chronicles, um, where I'll draw in very briefly, it, it describes how he made molten images for Balaam uh, and he burnt his children in the fire. He replaced, he brought in all the foreign gods that God had cast out from the land of Israel. It was for that reason that the land was given to the to the Jewish people because of the wickedness of the Canaanites and those other tribes there, that they were practicing human sacrifice. And astonishingly, Ahaz brought it back into Judah. And, it, and, and he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 5, Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hand of the king of Syria. So because of the wickedness of Ahaz and the really dreadful things that he was doing. God gave him into the hands of the king of Syria. And back in Isaiah in chapter 7, which is the context of this, it says, it came to pass from verse 1, in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Isaiah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of, e of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it, and it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. It's a very striking phrase there, isn't it? When they heard that they were not facing only Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Rem the king of Israel, but that the Syrians were also joined hands with them. And coming up, then their hearts failed, their hearts were moved, 
as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. It's a very graphic description. And I, I hope you've never had such an experience where bad news comes in and, and your heart quakes at what's being said there. And it's that their strength wasted away. They were suddenly absolutely full of fear at these two enemies that were coming forth who had joined their hands. They were confederate. They had formed, as it were, an alliance to fight against them. And they were in deep trouble. They, they had a wicked king. They had no grounds upon which to call God. And it looked like absolute disaster was to come. And isn't it fair to say that this happens, doesn't it? To us when we're in our sin that troubles arise and and when we're before we know Christ we have no recourse to them uh, but what goes on in the world just causes us great alarm and you might say to some extent some of the things been going on in the world now to a small extent have caused that degree of fear to arise in the world and and in a similar disaster that was being faced here by Judah the world can be full of fear and how much fear there is in the world isn't there the, uh, we put our security and confidence in the the systems that we have the wealth and possessions that we have but when those are shake, shaken we realize just how frail they are and how desperately frail and, and vulnerable we are and what fear can emerge and this is the context in chapter 8 and where we took up our reading where an ungodly king is faced by a confederacy from the king of Syria and the king of Israel who have come up very violently to destroy Jerusalem and make an end of Israel. But in verse 11, we pick up in chapter 8 of Isaiah, the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand. And thank God that the word of God came forth. And it wasn't just a, a vague word from God. But it came with a strong hand. I suppose it was a deep conviction to the prophet Isaiah. It was a, a burden, a heavy burden, that he knew without a doubt that he had to speak that which God had said. It was uh, maybe different to the other things that God had said, but it was with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom the people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. And the book of Isaiah, and I trust that tonight it might encourage you to read it. We should know, read the, all the Bible, shouldn't we? And the book of Isaiah is full of these strong words, but also full of comfort, because it's full of many passages where we see the comfort that God will send through the Lord Jesus Christ being our sacrificial lamb. But he starts off with a negative as saying, fear ye not their fear, nor be afraid. So you, we're not to say there's a confederacy. We're not to uh, raise this up and say how dreadful Syria and Israel are now in an alliance to fight against us. And that's it. That's the end of us. We're not to fear their fear, nor to be afraid. And this is the word that God gives to encourage them. And there are many people in this world who, who are just foolish and they have no fear. Not because they have no grounds to be afraid. And, and in fact, in most instances, when we're outside Christ and we have no fear, it's because we do not know the God who is holy, to whom we will one day give an account. But there is a, a casting off. But here he's not saying to have no fear just because you shouldn't fear, but rather because verse 13, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. You see, when we think about when the Lord's back in chapter seven talks about what is going on with Rezin and Pekah, the son of, Re uh, of Remaliah, he says this from verse eight. Well, sorry, he says this from verse five. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil accounts thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us, and to set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. Thus saith the Lord God, It shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. And we might say, 
Why is it that they're not to fear these mighty armies that are coming to destroy them? And he says this in verse 8, For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within three score and five years, that's 65 years, shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. If you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. And what's the Lord saying here? He's saying, yes, you've got these great nations who are coming to fight against you. But just meditate on this for one moment. Yes, they represent nations. What's their capital? Well, for the Assyrians, it's Damascus. And who's their king? Oh, well, it's this man, Rezin. And how about, how about, is, how about Israel? Well, the head of that is, is um, Pekah, the son of Remali, who incidentally was a very treasonous man who murdered the king and became king. And what the Lord is saying is, the point is, these are but men, aren't they? That they are but men. Yes, they might have great strength under their power, but ultimately they are just flesh and blood. They, they are, as before me, they are as nothing. And I thought of a little illustration of this that's in the Old Testament, in the book of, in the book of Esther. Do you remember that time when the, the king of the Medo-Persian Empire, I mean, what a, and what a kingdom. It says that his kingdom stretched from India to Ethiopia. That was how vast the, the Medo-Persian Empire was. And they had destroyed the Jewish people. And the, the king of them was Ahasuerus. And we might have thought, what a, a tremendously powerful man and what an emperor. But we also see he was just a man. And in chapter six of Esther, it says that one night he could not sleep. On, the night, on that night, he could not sleep. The king could not sleep. And, and, it, and it may sound like a silly point that I'm making, but when you think about it, the king needed to go to bed every night, just like you and I need to. And sometimes he wasn't able to sleep. He was just a frail man like you and I. And one day he would sleep his final sleep of death and go no more on. And this is just what the Lord is saying in chapter 7. The head of Syria is Damascus and the head of Damascus is resin. The point is that he is a man. And this is a very obvious thing that I'm saying here. But going back to chapter eight, why is it that we should not fear a confederacy between these two men and, and nor fear their fear, nor be afraid? Isn't it because verse 13, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. See, who is the king? over Judah and over Israel. It is the Lord of hosts, mighty in battle, the one who inhabits eternity, who slumbers not nor sleeps. You see, you're not a nation who has no God. You're not to fear these men, but you are to fear God. And as you know, those who know the book of Isaiah, in chapter 6, Isaiah is given the vision, isn't he, of God? And we sung a couple of hymns to start the meeting that were based on that. And he saw the Lord high and lifted up and seated upon his throne. Sorry, and uh, upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. And then the angels cry one unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. See, Ahasuerus commanded an empire from India through to Ethiopia, but he would soon fail and come to nothing. But the Lord of hosts is seated in the heavens in his holy temple. And he, his, the whole earth is full of his glory. And we read to open the meeting tonight, I read from Revelation 4 verse 8, that it adds to this. You see, not only are the angels crying sometimes in that manner, but it actually says in Revelation that they Rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And this is why in chapter 8, we get the Lord saying, Don't elevate these men in your estimation and in your sight. Rather, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. And he's deliberately using that title, isn't he? The, the angels of the Lord are, 
millions and millions aren't there, and his chariots are, are without number. This is the Lord of hosts, not the Lord of just one nation, a man who is king for a time and then goes. No, this is the one who changes not, who, who is the same yesterday and today forever, as we mentioned earlier in the meeting. Sanctify him. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And I'd like to say a little bit more about this positive thing, because isn't this something of the answer to the times now that we live and indeed the, the biblical prophecies as they come on? Because we will, won't we, see the earth being increasingly shaken by various things. And, and it says that men's hearts will fail them. The, there'll be a perplexity that is a puzzlement and no solution. America's thrown an astonishing trillions of dollars to be able to fix this small shaking that God has made upon the nations with coronavirus. And yet there will be more, won't there? As the birth pangs go on, they'll grow in intensity and severity and frequency. And it'll become a point where men's hearts will, will fail in the same way that the hearts of the Judah, of Judah failed at that time. And, and we might well say, well, how are the Christians to maintain their peace through that time? What, how are we to be? Well, isn't it that we are to sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be our fear? Now, what does this phrase mean to sanctify the Lord of hosts? We know that the Lord is absolutely holy. He is perfect and unchangeable. And it doesn't mean, does it, that word sanctify means to make something holy. It doesn't mean that we somehow make the Lord holy because he is holy, holy, holy. But it's the point of our hearts and our reflection towards him that we in our hearts are, as it were, those angels who cry, holy, 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 that in our hearts we have set the Lord apart and the one to whom we fear and the one to whom we dread, the one who our hearts turn towards and whose views and whose status we have regard to. He is sanctified in our hearts. And some might say, well, isn't this just something of a, an old covenant application of this. And I don't want to have many cross references tonight, but I think it's it's important just to see that this is is equally applicable to the new covenant and is in a way that we might be free from fear. Could you turn to 1 Peter chapter 3? And verse 11, oh sorry, verse 10. Uh, I'll just read down to verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, and if you're not quick at turning, then I'll read this out to you. For he that will love life, this is verse 10, and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Do you see that mirror of that verse there? You know, do not be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Don't be fearful of man. If you suffer persecution for Christ's sake, happy are you. Don't fear man. Don't be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And again, we might say, well, that's easy to say that, isn't it? But when you're facing persecution and serious persecution for the name of Christ, then the, this, these words can see, seem trite. But rather, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And isn't that just it, the same application we have in Isaiah 8? That it's not that we're to be people without fear, somehow oblivious to the things that are going on. But we have one whom we see who is high and lifted up, who is holy. It's him to whom we have regard. It is his view and opinion of us that we're concerned in. And we know him to be greater than all the armies of the world that exist, all the great kings and empires that will ever raise, are nothing compared to God. He says later in Isaiah 57, I have referred to it once, for thus saith the high and holy one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. That's the one 
who we are to sanctify in our hearts. The, the kings and the nations, where is Rezin? Where is Pekah, son of Remaliah, now? Where, where are they? But the Lord, he remains high and lifted up, and his train fills the temple, and day and night, ceaselessly, the angels cry, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is the one whom we are to sanctify in our hearts. And you see, Peter here applies it absolutely to us. Neither be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify. This is verse 15 of, of 1 Peter 3. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's uh, the way that we are to be as we see these things going on around us. We're not to be fearful of those things, but we're to sanctify the Lord God in our, our hearts. And I, I just as an aside, isn't it striking when the Lord Jesus Christ is challenged by the Jews about Abraham and how the Lord answers him is rather in a similar way to this. where He says, are you greater than our father Abraham? And of course, they're saying, don't be ridiculous, Christ. You you are not greater than him. And how does the Lord answer? Before Abraham was, I am. I am the one that inhabiteth eternity. I, I, I have no beginning and no end. Am I greater than Abraham? Absolutely. I am that high and lofty one, the high and holy one that inhabiteth eternity. This is the Lord Jesus Christ. Back into Isaiah chapter 8. And verse 13, sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear and let him be your dread. You see, the crying need that Judah had at that time was not a military solution to go forward and defeat the Syrians and, and to defeat Israel. And they, they turned, they hired some mercenaries from Assyria. They, they paid the Assyrians to come and deliver them. What they really needed to do was to get, get right with God. Why was it that the Syrians were coming up? It's because they had backslidden and Ahaz and the kingdom of, of Judah had sinned against God. But what they really needed to do was sanctify the Lord of hosts himself to let him be their fear and let him be their dread. They needed to get right with God. And isn't that just the case now as we see all these things going on where solutions could be thrown at the world's problems, the, the, the woes that come upon us and at an individual level? Individuals can face various troubles and problems, can't they? And they can throw all sorts of solutions at it. But isn't it ultimately the need to get right with God, to repent and believe the gospel, to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved, to be delivered from our sins? And then we're not promised a life of prosperity and ease. But the point is, the one who inhabits eternity is the one to whom we must get right. And this is what Judah needed to do. They needed to turn back to God. And those who know the book of Isaiah will know we might say how their sins were crimson. They had committed such wickedness. I mean, think of Ahaz. Think what he did. He had sacrificed his children. He had made human sacrifices to false gods. And you might think, well, there's no way back now to God when we got so far from him. And yet what does the book of Isaiah says? Teach us. It tells us that God has a son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, whose blood was shed for us upon the cross, that our sin, though crimson, might be made as white as snow, that though our sin is a crimson, we can come and reason together with the Lord. Let's not worry about resin and pica. Let's, let's worry about our sin before God and get right through the means that he's provided through the Lord Jesus Christ, that sacrificial lamb slain from before the foundation of the world and this is what he's saying. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. Well, may I say a few things just to finish off with tonight. To what extent do I sanctify the Lord God in my heart? Am I moved by those things going on in the world, by troubles when they arise? And, and don't get me wrong, we, we do still have that, don't we, where things suddenly and seriously go wrong. Then our hearts can be moved. But what must our recourse be? Mustn't it be to sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be our fear and our dread, that we should have that right regard of God? And won't that deliver us from many things that we're concerned with, with which we should take 
no concern for, that if our heart is fixed upon him. Later in Isaiah, he says that he'll keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Isn't that the same idea that we have the Lord sanctified in our hearts? How much to do I think of the Lord on on a daily basis? To what extent is my mind preoccupied by other things? And to what extent is my heart preoccupied with the Lord? To what extent is he sanctified in my heart? But he is the one to whom we must look. And if I might add just one last thing, that is that we don't, we unlike the old covenant where they had no priest or high priest who could really deal with their sins. But now, as we sanctify the Lord in our hearts and we consider his holiness, his glory and his might, all the great attributes of God, we also recall that we have a great high priest who's there in that very presence of God. And it says that who has gone into heavens and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. I'm reading from the end of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22. But the point is, we have a high priest who's gone into that place that was seen in Isaiah 6, who is there interceding on our behalf, who's at the right hand of God and who is over all. And that's why I want us to sing that song before we turn to the scripture. Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall and devils fear and fly. And isn't he the one whom we should sanctify in our hearts? See, the Lord would not have us moved by these things that go on in the world and will indeed go on in the wrong way. He would not have us to give undue care and fear to those things to which we should not fear. But as we walk with the Lord, we should sanctify the Lord himself the Lord of hosts himself, who is with us. And let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And I'll finish with this in verse 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary. I won't go on to the negative that follows on there. But for those who do that, God will then be a sanctuary from that storm, that we will be able to abide those things. And though it seems impossible to consider how can it be that we could bear and abide through those, if we, first of all, put first the Lord and his name in our lives, then he, the Lord of hosts, will be a sanctuary from all this trouble that will come upon him. Oh, that Ahaz might have turned to God at this time. And we can do that, can't we? For us, the day of grace is now here. We may turn to him. We may turn from these things that trouble our hearts and we may sanctify the Lord himself. And he shall be for a sanctuary for us when we do that. Amen. Well, I wonder if we might finish um, with the great song, Rejoice in the Lord, O oh, let his mercy cheer. I wasn't able to touch on this just to be as brief as I could tonight, but this picks up some extra truths which we can also, with which we can cheer our hearts this evening.
Well, shall we just close in prayer together? Lord, we are so grateful for all that's in the word of God. And indeed, Lord, that the angels long to look into these things. And what a privilege it is to think of all your works, your perfection of your ways and that truth indeed, that if God be for us, who can be against us? So, Lord, we pray that we might be bold in the gospel and indeed, Lord, that we might sanctify you in our hearts always. And Lord, you know the frailty of our frames and we pray that this week our hearts might be fixed and that you would grant that we may not look to those things of this world, but we might look to that King, the Lord of hosts, who is seated upon his throne and we might walk before you. So we thank you for the privilege of knowing you this night and commit our way to your hands with thanksgiving. Amen.